want to at least hear a little, just think about what you're going to do a year from now when you're making all that money. So, up to maybe fourth year, you think of engineering as it's heat transfer and it's fluid mechanics and it's mass transfer. You think about the courses and the technology. Now, in fourth year, as you're taking design and you're taking some of these other special courses, you can think about engineering as not just not the technologies, but what kinds of problems you're going to solve. And so you could build a career on what kind of problems you're going to solve. I know some of you are interested in finance and marketing and engineering and management. And, uh, and maybe one or two of you are so keen on process control. You're taking Dr. Schwartz's course now. So what about safety? Well, there is such a thing as a safety engineer. So you could be a chemical engineer and you could build your career working on safety topics. These are some of the topics that safety engineers work on. Uh, so, fire and explosions. There's fluid mechanics, chemistry, thermodynamics involved in that. Leaks and, dis and dispersion models. So, how quick? If you got a little crack in a, in, a, in a vessel, how much would leak out? And then how would it disperse through the plant and through the community? So there's a lot of fluid mechanics there. Toxicology and hygiene. Naturally, some of you are taking a lot of biology and biochem, so uh, using those skills. Uh, procedures and training. This would have a lot to do with don't climb up on a ladder without a friend holding the ladder for you, those kinds of things. So you do a lot of mechanical and electrical work there. Special equipment design for safety, so designing something like a flare that burns the, the, the byproduct gas, so that would be a safety engineer. Uh, and then a couple of topics over here, the safety hierarchy is what we're going to talk about today, we're going to start talking about today. These are special pieces of equipment and control systems to keep the plant safe. So if you're a safety engineer, you are working on those. And also safety reviews, so sort of when you decide uh, what to use there, and also accident investigations, sort of a post-mortem. Why did that accident occur? How can we prevent it from occurring again? So these are the kinds of things that, that you might be doing as a safety engineer if you choose to, to follow that field. What we're doing is the low right-hand side. So you notice that you got a team of people working here on, on safety. So when we're doing a safety review, we need somebody who knows the chemistry, somebody who knows machinery, somebody who knows the, the, uh, the process control, somebody who's familiar with operating a plant, uh, somebody perhaps who knows toxicology and hygiene and product quality issues. So there's always a team going on here. So you're going to Whatever you do, unless you go to law school, when they go to law school, then you're not going to be an engineer anymore. But you'll wear nice clothes and charge $300 an hour. Uh, yeah, more. That's okay. Engineers can charge more than that, too. I do. So, uh, <laughs> so you'll be involved in these teams. Even if you're not a safety specialist, you definitely will be. You'll be involved in these that's why we're concentrating on those and not, uh, let's say, leak and dispersion. You might not do this topic up here, but you definitely be working in this area. Okay, so there are definite, you know, definite uh, career opportunities in this field. So think about, for all your courses, how, how might I be doing this in the future? So any questions on, on these issues? There's a textbook by Crowell and Lamar. It gives an overview of some of these topics.
Okay, so the safety hierarchy. We have special equipment that is built into every process, should even be built into your laboratories to keep the equipment safe. So that's, and, and we're going to talk about six layers of hierarchy. We're going to concentrate on, the, on four of them, and we'll see all what we see all So our safety design must account now for failures, for failures of all kinds of equipment, including safety equipment, and of course people, because people make mistakes. We talked about some of those uh, last week. We have to account for multiple failures. Typically, one failure is easy to diagnose and figure out what's going on and fix it. But when two and three and four things happen at the same time, that's when people really have trouble diagnosing it. And we have to account for that in our design. Now, we can't account for everything. Now, what if a 747 lands on my plant? Tough. It's too bad. Although, nuclear reactors our design, that containment vessel, is designed to have an airplane hit it. Now that was before 9-11. Uh, okay, but, but, uh, so, so if you have a nuclear process, then you can start thinking about, well, what if that really weird accident doesn't happen? Uh, okay, so responses, as, as things happen, as, as things that aren't supposed to happen happen, we don't want to just immediately shut the plant down. That's very expensive. So, so we have to have a sort of a, a, a range of, of reactions. We want to take the the, the least uh, strong reaction possible. So we may just be able to go and change the cooling a little bit. In some cases, in other cases, we may have to shut the process down, stop it. Okay. So automation. A lot of this is automation. Some of it is people. Uh, if they work if they're designed to maintain properly. We saw some cases where things were maintained and they didn't work. We needed them. Okay, so here's a little flash drum, and I know you all remember that from chapter two of my textbook in process control. That you've got it memorized. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, Alright, so this is sort of where we almost left off in process control. Is that process safe? Are we done? Can we go out and build it? Say, okay, I've done my engineering. Let's build this thing. Do the hint over there. That guy's running. And you should run too. And we stop there. But we're not going to stop. Okay. So take take 30 seconds. Talk to a friend and say, find one thing that you think is unsafe about this. And then we're going to work through it. So what's one thing? 30 seconds. So this is the flash drum example. The feet's coming in here, it's getting heated up. We have liquid coming out the bottom, we have vapor coming up the top. That's just uh, yeah, so there's some stuff that's already so far. So that's the same Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Oh, good. Yeah. okay, we're going to keep going now, and we'll, as we go through the exercises, we'll see, see if, if you identify some of the problems. All right, so what's in this topic? Four layers of safety hierarchy, that's actually six, but we're going to concentrate on four. The methods and equipment at each one of those four, four layers of hierarchy. And we'll do some examples as we go through this, and then we may have time for a little shot. Probably not. Yet. Okay, so here's the picture. The, the pictures I'm going to show you are three different pictures of this hierarchy. Here's the first one. This is sometimes called a, an onion diagram. So you, know, you peel the onion, you get into different. Every onions have lots of layers. So the first layer is basic process control system. Basic process control. Here. 
Then the next layer is alarms. The next layer is something called safety instrument system. So you've talked about in 3P the basic process control system. You mentioned alarms, probably didn't, but you may have mentioned alarms. So the little green thing is all 3P3. But we still have another five layers to go. Right? So the next one's alarms. The next one's safety uh, instrument <coughs> system. So that's an automated system that takes very, very aggressive action. Okay, so very, very aggressive action. Then we have pressure relief over here, so things don't blow up. Then we have something called containment. So if you drive by a petroleum refinery and you see all those big tanks, what happens when one of those tanks starts to leak? Does it just go into the neighborhood? You usually have a field around the tank, and yeah. concrete, so that when it spills, it just contains it. So they have a dike. So they have a containment. So if that thing starts to, to that thing empties, it's going to be held in this larger dike around, around the tank. So their containment, there's lots of different ways to do containment. That big vessel around the nuclear plant is a containment vessel. So if you have a meltdown and you start releasing radioactivity, it's supposed to stay inside that thing. Strong vessel. And then finally, we have emergency response. Okay, so all, all of our plants will have all of these, typically. There's another way to look at it, which is probably a, a better picture. Now, this isn't in your notes, but it's in that chapter that's posted. So we, we want to be in the green area down here. That's the deviation from where we want to be. So little things happen all the time, and then we have our basic process control system that keeps us uh, at, at the controller set point. And so you've done, you've done a lot of that stuff, which you're on the EID controller. But what happens if the, the disturbance is too big? This controller can't, can't correct. Maybe if it's already opened its valve, the cooling valve, completely. Then we come up over here, and we have alarms. And people have to take action, and hopefully we can come back down into the green region. If those actions aren't done in time, or they're not, but they don't have the ability to, to control the system, then we're going to go up here to the safety instrumented systems, or safety shutdown systems, sometimes they're called. So we're going to really take strong action. And this is automated by computers. It's going to try and shut the plant down. Hopefully that'll bring it forward. What if that's not enough? Then if the pressure keeps rising, we're going to have some pressure relief. That means we have to vent this material. If we have to vent the material, that's not good. We've got it inside a vessel because it may be dangerous material. So if we vent it, that's better than having this, the, the equipment explode, but it's not so good, so we're going to have to have some kind of containment as well. And then finally up here comes the fire department for the emergency response. So these are the layers, and we have to have all of these layers set up. Questions so far? Another way to look at it is strength and reserve. So I think Napoleon kind of put his, his poorest soldiers out in the front. You know, maybe they didn't have guns, they only had pikes. And then he kept, and then he had better soldiers and better soldiers, and they had this elite guard up here that was really going to take, uh, take uh, the strongest action. So we have strength and reserve. And what's key over here is these have to be independent. Have to be independent. It wouldn't do any good to have four different layers, and if I went over and pulled the plug, all four layers would, would be inactive. But, but that's really that's not four layers. That's one layer. So we have to have four independent layers. So in our design, we have to make sure that the equipment are operating independent. <coughs> See some. Okay. So. When you did 3P3, you talked about control objectives, and the first three really had to do with safety. 
and then we get down into profit. So we're really talking about these up here when we talk about the basic process control. Okay, so the basic process control, you know the stuff for PID, cascade, oh man. Yeah, you know this stuff. So we're going to apply at the basic process control layer, we're going to use this process control for safety. Not to make money, other reasons, but product quality control. We do those as well. We're going to concentrate on, on the control loops that are there for safety. So what are the, some of the things we, we uh, would definitely want to control? Always control an unstable variable. So what is an unstable variable? Yeah. Can that be something that could change very quickly? Okay, it's change quickly. Oh, I'm tie this to my wrist. Um, okay, so here's time. In that direction, and here's our variable. The end. Some variable. So it could change quickly, but what's the key thing? Actually, an unstable variable could change slowly, although know, typically they don't. But what's the key thing about the unstable variable? <coughs> yes. Do you have an idea? No, I do. Okay, yeah. So so a stable variable, let me draw a stable variable, it's a dash line. Something happens and the stable variable kinda comes to some new steady state. That's a stable variable. Now, an unstable variable, something happens and it keeps going. And it keeps going and it keeps going. Now the mathematicians will tell you that an unstable variable goes to plus or minus infinity. But way before it goes to plus or minus infinity, something bad happens in the plant. Right? So, so we know that somewhere up here there's going to be an explosion. Whatever. So unstable variables are bad. And if we find an unstable variable, we have to control it. Okay? So that's the unstable variable. Do we have more colors here? That's unstable. Because that's going to happen. Something really bad is always going to happen. Unstable variable. Now, it also says, what about, it says, always control quick variables, things that change fast and are related to safety. So, let's say we've got another variable over here. Now, this is a stable variable, but this one is related to safety. Now, what happens if this is 20 seconds and it's really bad if it goes beyond that blue line. So it's a stable variable. It's not going to go off to infinity. So that's not a danger, but if it's what's called safety related, so there are some boundaries here outside of which something bad's going to happen. And this variable tends to move quickly, so too fast for people to, to, to always look at and make a correction fast enough, then we want to make sure that we control that variable as well. Now if it takes 12 hours to get to someplace bad. Hopefully somebody's going to take a look in that 12 hour period. But if it's a few seconds or a few minutes, then people don't have the time. Remember that a, an operator is probably monitoring about 200 variables. 200 variables all the time. That would be that person's job. So to say you have to see this variable in 20 seconds do something bad, is, is not reasonable to expect a human being to do it. Okay. If the person only had that one variable, maybe that's okay. Okay, 
Okay, so we have we always want to control unstable variables, and we want to control stable variables that are related to safety and tend to change perfectly. Okay, then we can monitor variables that change slowly, like corrosion and things like that. Because that takes months and years. Also, we want to make sure that our plant is safe when the equipment in the basic control system fails. Oh, what's going on here? First, we use the basic control system to keep the plant safe, but we have to account for the fact that that equipment can fail. You say, this is getting complicated. No, it's getting safe. You know, we're dealing with high pressures. 30 atmospheres is not really that high. 800 Celsius is not an unusual temperature. Dealing with hydrofluoric acid or phenol or methyl isocyanate are not unusual for chemical engineers, so we really have to be safe. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. Right? Where would we use basic process control in the plant process? So, look for unstable variables or quick variables and from where the equipment could fail. Okay? So take a couple minutes and work on that, and then we'll call on one of the fine groups here to give us an answer. So what variable should be controlled, and which valve should you use to control? Variable from this side over here. Anybody find an unstable variable? One that would go off to infinity? Let's look at the vessel and the liquid in the vessel. So if um, I call that variable F liquid, that's the amount of liquid that is coming into the vessel, and this is F5. And I did a material balance on, on that uh, material balance. The system is the liquid in the bottom of the tank, and what would my material balance look like? It would be accumulation equals in minus out. Okay. What's the in term? What's the out term? Five. <coughs> And what's the accumulation now? If I want to, I'm interested in this, this level here. It's changing volume with respect to time. And if the cross-sectional area is constant, there's a little bit of a, this would be entirely true. A D L D T. So that's the accumulation is equal to the N minus the out. Now, does the flow in depend upon the level in any way? No. So this is say F L not a function of the level. It doesn't depend upon the level. Now what about F5? Five dependent on the level. Okay, let's do let's do the garbage can with water in that. I've got a garbage can, it's full of water, and I poke a hole right here. Does this flow out depend upon the level? Yes. Yes, it does. Yes, it does, absolutely. No pump, then the driving force is that head of liquid. Right? So the flow out depends upon the level. Now, 
What about in our chemical plants? We've got a pump here. So this is the pressure at the outlet of the pump. And that's approximately constant. Approximately constant. Now, does F5 depend upon the level? F5 only depends upon the pressure here, the pressure down here, and the opening of the valve. So F5 does not depend upon the level. That's important for pumps liquids. So if I plotted this, versus time, the level, and let me plot F5. So let's just say, I'm going to make this, I'm initially at steady state. We can always do that. Now I'm going to make it a decrease in F5. And I can do that by going over to this valve and just closing the valve a little bit. Then what happens to the level? Initially, what happens? It disappears. Aliens come in and drink all the food. It increases, it decreases. One of those four. Don't worry about the aliens. So, does it increase or decrease? Start to increase or decrease? Increase. Starts to increase. And it just keeps going. If I don't make any correction, it just fills up the, the vessel. If I increase the flow, then the liquid goes down and down and down until there's no liquid in the tank, and then the pump runs dry and we damage it. So that level is unstable. It's an unstable variable. Now remember, that's different from our garbage can. Our garbage can over here, poke a hole in it. This is stable, but we can't build our plants this way. Otherwise, we have to have them on the side of the hill. The first unit's on the top, and we have things. That doesn't happen. Now, we have a lot of flat ground, so we're, we're going to build them on flat ground. We're using pumps. So if we pump liquid out of a, a vessel, that level is going to be unstable. We said anything that's unstable, if you don't pay attention to it, it's going to fill up the vessel. That could be very, very dangerous. When we do the workshop next Monday, we're going to see this was one of the mistakes that led to 15 people being killed. We want to control that level. Okay, now, turn to your friend and explain why that level is unstable. I want to hear 30 voices immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, does, does anybody have questions now? If you can't, if you couldn't describe it, then you have a question. What's your question? What's your question? You can ask questions. I'm not going to break the course. I don't care. We'll throw him out, and then we can talk. Great. Pump levels are always unstable. This argument is in, uh, by the way, is in chapter 18 of the textbook. I mean, if you didn't sell it back, you still have the textbook. You can look at chapter 18 and go through this argument about why the pressure is essentially constant and fact uh, unstable systems. So if I want to control the level, what's a, what's a valve that I can use to control the level? Five. 
I valves. Does V3 influence the level? Yes. If I, but V3 also sets my production rate. So I'd like to control the level and not influence the production rate. So is there another valve other than V3 that has a strong effect on the level? V5. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna control, I'm gonna make this a controller. <coughs> So I'm going to make this a controller. That's a C. That's a layout. And make this a controller. So now I'm going to control with using the feedback principle that level. Okay? Very important. If I don't do that, somebody's going to get hurt. So that's my unstable variable in this process. I don't believe you. Somebody has a question. All right. Do we have a fast variable that, that's important? What's a, what's a, if you look at this and you, if you say, I don't know, I don't know, that doesn't look safe. What would the first thing you look at say, this doesn't look safe? Pressure. Pressure. A closed vessel. We always have to deal with pressure in those closed vessels. We always deal with pressure in those closed vessels. Okay, I'm going to erase this. Going once. No questions? Going twice. Now, we're going to have a stable variable. But it's safety related. Now we have this pressure coming down here. There's no pump, of course. So I'm going to have some constant times the pressure dt. And you can use the ideal gas law to, to do like this. It's equal to the flow in. Let's call this flow vapor. Balance on the vapor space now, the vapor space on the top of the tower, and what's the a fourth? And that was uh, vapor minus F4. Does F4 depend upon the pressure P1? If the valve's constant and P1 increases, what happens to the to the flow? <coughs> V5 is constant, and the pressure 1 increases, what happens to the flow rate? It increases, right? So as this pressure increases, this flow rate increases. So if I made a, a step change to V4, the pressure would start at a steady state would do something like this. It's sort of like the garbage can problem. Or this is a big So that's a stable variable. The problem is that that vessel has a certain strength, a certain maximum operating pressure. And the, yes, sorry, what is that changing? This is V4. Uh, oh, V5, sorry. So, so, when we design our plants, we can design every piece of the equipment for a thousand atmospheres. And then Canada would have no manufacturing at all. It would be too expensive. So our equipment is designed for maybe 20% above normal operating pressure. Maybe. And so if the pressure starts to go up, we're in danger of an explosion relatively quickly. So this is a fast variable, and it's safety related. 
So even though it's stable, you must control that variable. You see that? I asked that it's going to move into from a from a safe point to an unsafe point too quickly, faster than we expect the human beings in the plant to recognize and take corrective action. So, yes? This is a bit of a sidebar, but <coughs> you said most of the vessels in Canadian manufacturing are about 20% say over spec for operating. If you want to take that vessel to say a higher uh, pressure rating, are there certain ways that you can go about doing that, or are you looking at an entirely new vessel? Entirely new vessel. I mean, it's, it's when they fabricate it, they also test it. And they actually, when they, when they build it, and then they test it, they sort of stamp it and say, that's what the maximum pressure is for this vessel. So if it, it were operating at five atmospheres, and actually, for some reason, the vessel <coughs> Good for 10 atmospheres, you could take it up to 8 atmospheres. Yep. But generally speaking, we're talking about wall thickness and the type of steel. So you're going to look at a new, a new vessel. Okay. Okay. This question. Okay, so we see what happened here. It's going to be fast. Get the high, high pressure too fast. That's not good. It explodes. So what valve would we use to control P1? Does V2 affect P, the pressure. Yeah, we make more vapor, so the pressure will go up. But this vapor liquid split here is what is what is the reason for the flash drum. It's, it's like a one-stage distillation tower. So this is one-stage distillation <coughs> tower. And and so we probably don't want to use these valves here because they're going to affect the composition of the separation and also the production rate. So what valve should we use? Okay. Make this a controller on what valve? Posted, I think, right? So these are. <coughs> no. So, no. 
we control the 450. And we set an alarm shown here to tell the operator something's happening. We're going to go fix that on the sensor. Okay, so there's a way that you can have one. We dealt with the sensors, but we still have to. What happens if the valve doesn't work? Well, that's for this. That's going to come up in the next lecture. Yeah. Thank you.